Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. And again, we have another fabulous show lined up for you. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit. Um, It it was approximately, I think, about a year and a year and a half ago. And we are and were in the middle of COVID. And we're starting to look at we're starting to look at the network and what we want to open the door for what we want to bring forward. And I remember myself, Linda and Jessica, we're sitting there and we're talking about, okay, what is it in our world that we absolutely want and yet we don't have yet? I think it's actually a little bit longer than that because it was like smack in the middle of my first knee replacement, right? Mm. And I remember us talking about that and we're all sitting around and I said, here's the thing. I loved when I launched the power up show. I said, I I just loved Mm -hmm. that we're bringing those topics that were so part of my life when I was younger. And, you know, and I, and and, and, and so we had a little conversation, of course, Linda's known me that long. And so she understood. And I said, you know, we have to have a door, a consciousness window open for people to come through to come through to us, to bring the power of the voice of freedom forward. Mm-hmm. That, that was all I said, you know, just the power of the voice of freedom forward. Yeah. I don't even know what that meant. It just like came out of my mouth, the power of the voice of freedom forward. And what I thought about then was the series of events that began to happen. And I met three incredible women. Mm-hmm. And these three women They kind of came together. You're going to hear how they came together. I think kind of in a similar way, but they had come together. And what they had come together to do, in their own words, which you'll hear today, is they had come together to bring forth a conversation, an inflection point conversation, cultivating change from the inside out, how to create a brave space for conversations about personal transformation, anti-racism, activation, and accountability. Mm -hmm. See, and I love that. And I love that. And when you look at the shows that these three women are doing, and you look at what they're taking on, and you're looking at the conversations, and you're listening to them, what you find in why people come together and why it is so important to bring different people together that may not always agree is what you find is something so much greater than the individual. Now, I got reminded of this yesterday in a pre-record I did with Dr. Krista Lee Crane. And I cannot believe some of the stuff that came out of my mouth, that came out of her mouth, that is just been kind of there. But what is it that we can do to go beyond that? And what I mean by that is go beyond that, to have a place where we are educating, where we are coaching, where we are teaching, where we are learning. Today's show is Activism Through Coaching Model, a catalyst for true, uh, I want to say allyship. I think that's that's, that's correct, with my very special guests. But they're radio hosts, they're TV hosts in their own right, Anita Russell, Mavis Bauman, and Gail Hunter. These are the three women you're seeing on the screen today. And I cannot even begin. I could go on, but I don't want to. You're going to get to know who they are, what they stand for, and what it is they have a vision in action for today. Because when we think at a coming together of sorts, does the old way work 
or do we need to literally tune into an energy that is so much greater than any one of us? Thank you so much, all of you, for joining the show today. It's great to see you. It's great, great to be here. here. Yes, it's wonderful to be yeah. here. Thank you. Do you all remember like some of the first meetings we had and we, we were like, we were like, oh, maybe we should change the background or, you know, I can't get my uh, camera to work or, you know, I mean, I'd be just like, I'm just remembering. And then I'm watching the evolution and, uh, you know, what I love about this, and I want to start with this question, activism through coaching model, I want to talk about, but I want to get the underpinnings of that. And Anita, I want to start with you because mm -hmm. I think it took all of you to get your feet in the game. Mm -hmm. Then to realize, oh, the shoes I'm wearing, they don't fit right. We got to get bigger shoes, right? And then you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, now, wait a minute, are these shoes going to help me crawl, walk, or run? Mm -hmm. And I'm talking today about running. Anita, tell me about this for you. What has this evolution been like for you to be able to come here forward and talk to people about what is being created in the minutes that we're speaking now? Absolutely. So just to give the listeners a little hint of uh, background, um, two things that happened in 2020, uh, you all have heard this story from me, uh, but two things that happened in 2020. Number one was my grandson Cairo was born on March 14, uh, 2020. And then a couple of weeks later, George Floyd was murdered. So we had one incredible life coming into the world and we had another life that was leaving uh, the world. And those two things uh, sort of ignited the work that we're doing today. And it started off for me with a very simple conversation that I had with my daughter, um, Cairo's mom. Uh, my two daughters were preparing to go out for a, a Black Lives Matter protest in uh, Pittsburgh following uh, the murder of George Floyd. And I, I, I would like to just sort of um, parenthetically say, I think the George Floyd moment was one of those moments where everybody will be able to look back 10 years from now and remember exactly where they were yep. when they saw that video for the very mm -hmm. first time, right? So my daughters are preparing for a march. And my younger daughter, she's very uh, expressive sometimes in her emotions. And I can tell like that when something is bothering her. So we sat I sat down with her. Um, we had a conversation and we talked about the fact that in my, in my lifetime, right, in that moment, three generations, my mother protested, I protested, and now my daughters were preparing to protest. But our attention was really on whether or whether or not Cairo, who at that time was about three months old, whether or whether or not Cairo mm -hmm. was going to have to protest in his lifetime. And that question just opened something up inside mm -hmm. of me. And once it came out, I couldn't I couldn't put it back. And so that became the Cairo question. And the Cairo question became sort of the that spark, like I said earlier, that really started this work to go. Because what I realized is what I want that the answer to that question to be is no. Yeah. Cairo does not have to protest for his birthright to peacefully and freely exist in the skin in which he was born. So that question just took on like such a big dimension um, for me. And out of that, I wrote a book called Cultivating Change from the Inside Out, The Power of Being Human. And then from there, I created this activism through coaching model. Then I got Mavis and Gail involved in the whole, in the whole entire thing. And just to um, the last thing I'd like to say before I allow um, someone else to speak is the reason it's activism through coaching is because that's what I do. I'm a yeah. personal transformation expert and I help people to kind of figure out where they are. Cause sometimes people don't even know where they are. They need help just to kind of define the space that they're currently living in and then figuring out where is that place that I really want to be and recognizing that there's a gap in between. And that gap in between is where coaching happens. It's where personal transformation happens. And so doing the work that we're doing in response to the Cairo question and anti-racism activation, as Pat had uh, mentioned, 
it made sense for me to kind of look at this through it as, as through that activism through coaching lens because it's what I it's what I was doing being yeah. an activist but then I'm also coaching but really really helping people to look at themselves and understand where do I fit in personally in all of this stuff with the George Floyd murder uh, the January 6th insurrection where do I fit in with all of that yeah my gosh Thank you for sharing that, because that really is at the bottom of so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, thank you for setting the backdrop for what we're about to talk about, because we don't even know what we don't know sometimes. And I thought, I never thought in my life, I will tell you this, and I'm telling you, I'm swearing it like it was yesterday. I never thought in my lifetime I would ever, 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 ever again, for as long as I live, have to worry about who controls my body. Mm -hmm. I thought, been there, done that, got scars from it. But there's something happens when we just take our foot off the pedal a little bit. And I don't mean about being angry. I mean about consciousness and awareness. And that really brings me to Mavis and Gail, because here you both mm -hmm. are now. You have become part of an energy and a team of this. Mm -hmm. and. When I first met you all, you all three were all in. I don't know that you all even knew what you were all in about, but <laughs> there was never a waiver of doubt from any of you. And Mavis, let's start with you and then Gail, you, mm -hmm. because I was so amazed by that. And each of you has a very personal reason for it. And I would like to hear from you because mm -hmm. this really... This idea about activism through coaching, and, and we'll get back to this, Anita, it really talks about concepts, pillars that we really need to pay attention to. Mavis, for you now, reflecting back and bringing us forward, right? You're still, but well, everybody's still here. Hello. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to start not so early this time. I'm going to start with the activism through coaching concept. Yeah. Um, I would not have ever uh, called myself a racist. I would not have thought I had any racist beliefs. But uh, working with Anita and Gail, I have been in this environment now where I do get to look inside and see what beliefs I have that are still there. Um, some of them manifest even in just a physiologic reaction to pe being around people of color. It's like, where did that come from? Right. I never, before this podcast, never knew, I never noticed that was happening. You know, I always, I guess I thought it was just protective or something, but why? What did I think I had to be protected from? So this, this process uh, of, of you know, using Anita's coaching skills has just been the biggest blessing. You know, she, she uses the term, you know, we have to have courage. It just hasn't, the only courage it's taken for me is to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I do remember that. Yeah. I do, we all remember that. <laughs> yeah, right, I made a big deal. But the, the, everything I learned to me is such a gift. Yeah. It's a gift. I do not want to be part of the racism in this country and in the world. I don't want to be part of it. And um, the things that I'm learning are just uh, uh, so helpful. And they're just filling me with more and more love for people, for the differences in people, which I've always appreciated, but it's, it's much more distinctive now and more powerful. Mm -hmm. And also, it, it really does, and from what I can tell, it's all it's given all of us a new way of speaking. It's yes. given us a shining light on new conversations. You know, I'm not kidding when I said I never thought that I would be sitting here thinking about doing an entire show for myself that focused around things that I had to fight for 40 years ago plus. Uh -huh. But we do, because yeah. when we take our hands off the wheel, right, somebody will grab it. And they will steer that car. And they may not steer that car in the direction you want to go. But I love what you shared. And I love how bold we can be about talking about the honesty of ourselves. Because guess what? We all got that in there. I don't care. We all got that in there, right? Yes. Um, 
Gail. Hmm. Now, I know when I first chatted with you, right? Mm -hmm. You had reasons for being here. Mm -hmm. You're still here. Mm -hmm. What has this been like? And what does the activism through coaching model mean to you? Oh, the model, um, you know, it's not an unfamiliar model because as a psychotherapist in my practice, I have been blessed with the ability to work with so many amazing people and helping them transform their lives, but the paradigm of their lives in so many ways that, so I have always been a part of that with others. Um, but it means the ability to step up with that courage and to look within to really look within deeply. It's like looking in that mirror, right? And that as you do that, you have to see what's really there, whether you want to or not. And sometimes it's hurt and sometimes it's difficult and sometimes it's not so difficult, but it's getting that honest with ourselves that as much as I am very anti-racist, I have, I mean, I grew up in a family that they were quietly racist. I have an older sister that was very vividly and openly racist and, um, and so I had to deal with that. That was part of my experience. And I went through the, you know, the late 60s, early 70s and, and the protesting and the, um, for a variety of things, including civil rights and yep. the, the Vietnam War and feminism and Roe versus Wade. And so I really always felt when I was able to do that, I felt like I was contributing something. Yeah. Even if it was one small voice or one small part Right, and I really believe that this forum has given all of us that opportunity to really look within and to express where we are and what we need to learn and how much I have not known that I have learned even just this past year. And so I'm very grateful. And, you, and thank you for sharing that because <clears throat> I don't think any of us realize that today on the day we're gonna talk, so much has happened this week. Right. Uh, and you know, it kind of brings me back. And first of all, for those of you out there, I want you to know that you are looking at three professional women who have looked at their lives. They've made decisions about how they would educate themselves. They've made decisions on what organizations they would founder, whether you are an eater and the founding principal of the place to soar, whether you are Mavis and you have gone through the Fletcher School of Law, you have been part of JP Morgan, you have then walked away from that, looked at freelance and photography, and now what? Formed and serves and is given back visionary for seed a better life. And we can go into that. Or like Gail just said, you know, when we signed up for this psychology thing, I don't know about you, Gail, but I know after I signed up and finished, I had to redirect what that was going to mean in my life. Yes. But the one thing that three of us have in common is we've had to face ourselves. We've had to face our own prejudices. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to that. I'm going to skip the break because I really want to get to this. I want to get back to you, Anita. Um, Yes, we could talk about the insurrection, but there's something else I want to bring up. I don't know why I'm still shocked. Yeah, Fred said something to me about a year ago when I found out about my grandfather's heritage. Secret in the family, people. How do you keep a secret that your grandfather was a farmer born in Brazil? changed his name, got rid of the non-vowels, put it back. How does a family keep that secret? Well, you keep it because you don't think there's going to be an internet. You don't think there's going to be Ancestry.com. And a friend of mine said, how do you feel about being Latina? I said, what? So now that is just another conversation for another show. <laughs> Because is there really a feeling? Is there a feeling about that? Am I ashamed and embarrassed? Do I feel like I'm too late in the game to even say that? What keeps us away from owning every aspect of ourself, including mm -hmm. the racism part? Now, here, Anita, I got to throw this back at you. Because if there was a coaching model that we could bring in and we could talk to people that sit in the congressional hall, I think it would be this one. Because here's what happened this week. Mm -hmm. There was a bill on a floor to try to protect same-sex gay marriage, but that wasn't the only thing in the bill. Mm -hmm. There was a clause in there about interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought, what? What do you mean? What do you mean that could be banned? You see, do you understand how my mind is being blown right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know there are other things in that, but I got to hang on to those too. We always knew that the gay marriage thing was going to come up time and time again. Never thought Roe v. Wade would come up. But help me understand the degree of ignorance by which we live in a world where a government can shine a light on the fact that interracial marriage may be something you'd go to jail for. Hello. I am with you 100%. When I read that, it blew my mind. That I didn't believe in, it. Right. Did you believe it, was, it? But that it was in that legislation. However, it crossed my mind previous to me uh, reading that when um, Justice Thomas talked about uh, after the, the, the Roe, Roe v. Wade was overturned. And then, um, you know, the justices were kind of giving their their thoughts, if you will. And I think it was, um, I can't remember which one of them it was, um, that was basically saying, no, this is it. This is just, we were just looking at Roe v. Wade. We're not going to look at anything else. Justice Thomas said, oh, no, 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 no. There are other things that we can take a look at which included the gay marriage, things like uh, contraception in marriage, which I, I don't even like know how, how is that even a thing? Uh, contraception in, Maddie, in marriage. But the one thing that jumped out at me that he did not allude to is interracial marriage because he's in an interracial Yes, And so yes. It, it just kind of blows me away that you want to, place this lens on other people by saying, well, maybe we shouldn't have this, or maybe we shouldn't have this. But then the piece of it that relates to you directly, because in my mind, mm -hmm. if you were, if, if, if you're thinking about these things in those types of like ab almost absolute terms, how can you leave interracial marriage off the table? You left it off the table because now you're talking about you personally. Oh. So you can't, leave it off the table when it's focused on you personally, but then you want other things to be uh, on the table when it's focused on other people. Like that was what clicked in my mind. It's like, well, if you're going to visit that, yeah. why are you leaving this one out? Oh, I'm not going to leave that out because I'm in an interracial marriage. Like, how does that even make sense? Yeah. But don't you, I want to hear from the other ladies too. I mean, were you like me? I mean, I consider myself kind of up to date on stuff. I'm not like, I don't glue myself to the news, television or any of that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't even think it was a thing we had to protect. I mean, come on. And if that is a thing <clears throat> we have to protect, come on and crawl out under the rock. Right? Because we already know that the Senate didn't pass the equal pay bill. We already know that this is just a level of crazy town that I had to pinch myself. I said to Linda, I said, like, what year are we in? Mm -hmm. Right. And she said, I think we're back to the year where you were marching every week. <laughs> Richard Nixon was the president. Right. I, I mean, she went on. Yeah. Okay. Mavis and Gail. See, this is, let's talk about this for a minute because I want to get to what uh, anti-racism activism and the journey is about. Cause we are talking about that. There are bridges that we cross in our life and we have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. This morning I did an interview where we make a decision to be happy. I want to talk about this. That is one thing that we can do, but we also have to make a decision about what is not negotiable for us. And right. then are we going to do anything about it? Are we are just going to zip our lips and just not say anything, Mavis? What are what are we what are we going to do? Help me here. I'm not going to zip my lip, but uh, <laughs> I think it's kind of an American characteristic to be a little bit passive because we've been so safe. And then we are shocked when something like Roe v. Wade going, being overturned happens. Um, you know, I don't know if you've seen the film, uh, Who We Are, uh, Jeffrey Robinson talks about the uh, journey toward anti-racism, how there have been uh, successes and we're going up this hill and we're doing well and we're doing well and then we fall back. Yeah. 
we're doing well and we're doing well and we fall back. It's just unacceptable. In my mind, I was thinking, oh my gosh, in my life, we've made a lot of progress. <laughs> well, right now it feels like it's, it's all being taken away and it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. shocking. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to be in this space because, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm just not a very outspoken person in terms of protesting in that, but I feel differently now about these issues. We have to be involved. We have to be vocal. And I think there's a lot of people like me. We care deeply and our voices are not being heard. Yeah, uh, Liz Cheney, uh, like uh, everything on her plate is now like in the back burner career, 20 points behind in Wyoming. Ask her if she, I mean, does she care? Yeah, but okay, I want to pop this over to Gail because Gail, I want you to talk about this too. Mavis, you're right. I mean, somebody said to me, uh, people say things to me. So you get a sense that people will email me and text me and they would just say stuff to me, right? Like, right. they, they just say stuff, just like stuff. Stuff. They're like, I heard you do that show. Uh, uh, I, I also heard you say you're not going to go out and protest again. So you're going to do nothing, Pat. No, I didn't say that in the interview. That is not oh, what well. I said in the interview. Right. But Gil, look, you are like the rest of us. You are working with people. You understand what's going on in the gay community as well. You mm -hmm. take a look at your life. And all three of you, what a life's worth of work and effort. And I got to ask you from where you sit, do you feel like this is a step back? Um, I think, I hope not, let's say. But I know that from working with people, that change doesn't happen just like a straight line up. There's always resistance to change, right? <clears throat> so you want to honor the resistance and keep moving forward and keep moving upward. And so... I, that's how I try to look at this. So, okay, so there's this resistance and it's a major resistance. I never thought I would ever, ever hear that, you know, RV Wade was going to be reversed, that, that somebody was going to dictate who I can love and who I can marry, that it was going to dictate what my sexual orientation would be. I mean, all of the issues, right? Let alone that if I, if I am, whatever color skin I have, doesn't matter, right? It should never matter. And yeah. Because we are all collectively, we come from the same source. We yeah. all are human beings, right? And we've lost that sense of humanity and that sense of um, humility, that sense of collectiveness that we have to begin to start looking at again. Now, yeah. what's going on here? So I'm grateful that that filter uh, has been taken off because you can't change what you can't see, right? right. And, and that's whether that's within you or outside of you. Yeah. And so we see, and now we must do something different. Yeah. I want to talk to you three. We're going to take a short break, but I'm going to say something right now. I'm going to give everybody time to think about this because most people understand the way I feel about things. And I will tell you this. I grew up in a family with a Republican dad and a liberal stepmom. Mm -hmm. And you should have been around those holiday dinners. Mm -hmm. Just saying. But what <laughs> I learned from that as I learned the art of conversation. Now, my stepmom did not have education. She had her first child 12, second child 13. She didn't have the formal education. But you could not have a conversation with her and not know she was in a place of knowing about life, about good things, about the good and bad in just everything there is, about how to live in a world that has contrast and contradiction. And I remember her saying to me, you're still going to visit down with me down in the deep south, and you are going to go to a Southern Baptist church. And I remember as a young child saying, okay, what's the big deal with that? And then I went. And I went to a community of people in a very small town, like a teeny town, in grandma's house with no plumbing, like an outhouse in a potbelly stove. And we went to the church. And the Giles boys and, and us got called out on something, but that's another story. Hmm. Called out right in front of the church for doing snuff by the railroad track. <laughs> but here's what I learned. Why did my mom say that? It wasn't about the church. She didn't care about the church. People of color, people, white people, dark people, 
white people, people of races I didn't know at the time in the church. But when that church was over, barbecue, cornbread, everybody eating from the same plates, the same bowls, using the same bathrooms. And I thank my stepmom who's looking at us right now and saying, girl, you better do me right. Let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about this. Well, Anita's going to talk about it. Anti-racism activism journey catalyzes, and we're going to talk about uh, allyship. And I want to say this. Thank you, Barack Obama. But I also want to thank Donald Trump. When we come back, I'm going to tell you why. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Oh, before we before we talk about this, and Micah had a great question, before we talk about the anti-racism activation journey and so forth, I, I would love for you all, first of all, let people know about your show. Let them know how to find out more about each of you. Anita, would you start? Sure, absolutely. Um, our podcast is called uh, Inflection Point Podcast, and I'm so happy that we're doing it on the transformation uh, on this network, and so yeah. that makes it incredibly uh, awesome. Uh, my website is the place to soar, and on that web on my website is where you can find out a lot about the work that I actually do as a uh, transformation expert, which I mentioned um, earlier. I do workshops, I do masterminds, I have an anti-racist uh, uh, social impact mastermind that I do. So that's the place to go to find out more about my work uh, outside of the podcast. Is the place to soar.com. Excellent. Thank you. Mavis, how about you? Um, I'm proud to say that I'm president of an organization called Seed a Better Life, seedabetterlife.org. Um, it, uh, it operates for the benefit of genocide survivors in Rwanda. And uh, now we're working with the next generation, their kids, and just how the genocide still impacts that country. Just a quick a quick advertisement. I just got a call today from my colleague, Deborah, in Rwanda, and one of our students got a job in Dubai and is doing so well. I mean, it's incredible to go from nothing to yeah. that. So uh, check it out, seedabetterlife.org. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Gail, for you. Uh, well, as a psychotherapist, you just have to look up, up under my name and you'll see information. But I also uh, started a nonprofit called OMA, Center for Mind, Body, and Spirit, but we don't have an actual physical center yet, but it's a virtual. But we do a series of lectures um, highlighting holistic practitioners all over the place. And we have a youth program for kids in the inner city um, that combines environmental issues, trauma-informed care, and, um, and artistic creativity. Uh, and we do a trauma-informed care tra training that we offer to places. And we also have a, a, web, uh, a webinar that we do once a month on, for survivors of trauma, of different types of trauma that we get on together who are survivors and as a panel, and we talk about different topics around it and a variety of other things. But so please, that's under www.omapittsburgh.org. I love it. Thank you. Oh, boy. Amazing. I want people to know that you know, we're not just here talking, that we are we are people that understand the power of action. Now, we may not be 100% clear about what the action might be we will take moving forward into next year, but we will get clear. You know, before the break, I said a couple of things, but I did say one thing. I did say it took two people, Barack Obama and Donald Trump, the election of Donald Trump. Uh, without either one of those happening, right, one and not the other, what would the conversation have been? But you see, we learn so much from polarization. We learn so much from contrast. And then Micah asked us a question, right? Micah, you want to ask everybody that question again? Yeah, yeah. And you're right, because, you know, I think Hillary's lesson is she said the loud part, quiet. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think let's just take Micah's comment, because it really does point to, you know, anti-racism activism journey. You know, how does it, how do we talk about this true allyship? How do we really get to that, right? Because now it's out. Mm -hmm. I think that the gentleman last night, the uh, representative from Illinois, uh, one of them said, the elephant's in the room, mm -hmm. right? I love that expression. Right. The elephant is now in the room. The anti-racism element, elephant is in the room. I'm not saying it hasn't been there before, but it was like a mouse, 
Like now it's an elephant, Anita, right? <laughs> it is absolutely an elephant. And, you know, sort of that, that whole thing with the elephant in the room is that uh, people, even though it's big, it's massive, people ignore it. But we're in that place now where we cannot ignore this. And um, the way that I look at a lot of this is between uh, COVID-19, George Floyd, the fact that Barack Obama was our president, and then we got Donald Trump next. All of those things actually opened up this Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And all of this stuff flew out, and now it's in everybody's faces. And that is the elephant that, that, that we're uh, talking about. It's in your face now. So you can't mm -hmm. ignore it. And I think if I were to if I were to say that there was something good that came out of Donald Trump's um, election, it would be that it blew the idea that we were living in a post-racial society completely out of the water. It just blew it completely out of the water. And in and, and that we know now that that elephant has been exposed, we know beyond of a shadow of a doubt that we are nowhere near being a post-racial society. Yeah, yeah. I want to make, I want to talk to, I want to get to this real quick and I want to get to uh, the comment that Micah made. Um, no matter what you think, we know why Hillary Clinton lost. And, and we could spend a whole show on the construct of women mm -hmm. not supporting women. That is a whole nother show. Yeah. That is a powerful show. I am actually going to do a show on that. But let me be very clear. 65,853,514 votes versus 62,984,829 is not an unpopular woman, right? Mm -hmm. There's something broken right there. But what's also broken is what Micah said. We can alter the minds of people by doing exactly what Micah said, taking those quiet things and making them loud, even if they're not true, then this is really where the work is. Mavis, give me your perspective on this, and let's talk about this idea of allyship, right? I'm not sure where to land on this, this question, but there's just something that's been on my mind today, and it and it connects to allyship, of course. Um, we interviewed a woman recently, Rebecca Stevens Alder. She grew up in Sierra Leone and now works in Paris. And she said this powerful statement. She said, I didn't know I was black until I was nine. Yeah. And it's just such a, a shocking statement to hear, like, how could yeah. you not know? It's because we created the label. And, and what I hope, uh, as uh, you know, uh, learning as an ally and continuing to do more work, that we can discreate that label and focus more on humanity as a whole, because our needs are all the same. We might have different opinions, different tastes, but not having compassion for each other is not working. It's not yeah. working. And you know, in in the world that Trump uncovered, it just. It, it exposed that lack of compassion and understanding for each other, uh, among so many other things. Did I speak to your question, Pat? Was yeah, of course you did. Of okay. course you did. Of course you did. Because you see, the question is one where we're getting new realizations right now. You know, mm -hmm. we're getting new realization. Yeah. You know, myself and my sister, my sister is 12 years older than me, and we grew up in an environment where the opposite was true of us. You know, to the point where my sister was 12 years older than me. And when she moved out, she kept, she lived, she continued to live in the projects in Yonkers. I don't know if you all know anything about the projects in Yonkers. They, when you, when people think about that area of the world, we don't even talk about that. We want to talk about the Bronx. You want, we want to talk about, you know, places like that. We don't talk about Compton, but I'm going to tell you where my sister decided to live and kept her door open. Hmm. In that ar arena, when my sister died, there were people lined up blocks and blocks mm. to come see her yeah. because she could have written the book on this. But if you ever asked her about it, 
she wouldn't talk about it. There was nothing she could say. And Gail, that's why I want to get to you. See, it wasn't a thing. Gay wasn't a thing. You know, if, if she cooked a whole bunch of like this food and put it on the table, people walk through the door. She didn't say like, oh, like you can't come in. Her mm -hmm. children married interracially. You understand what I'm trying to say? Right. right. And I wish she were here to help mm -hmm. me understand how she did it. But I know what she would say. She would say what was in my heart was pure love for humanity. Mm -hmm. Gail, for you, this idea of allyship not being a noun, mm -hmm. you know, but looking at it, right. it's a powerful, powerful thing. And then mm -hmm. we're going to get back to you, Anita, because there's an action required here, isn't there? Definitely. Gail, for you. Well, it ha there has to be an action. What your sister did, she lived that truth that she knew was in her heart. She lived that truth of what humanity is, right? She, she just knew it. She just lived it and yeah. she experienced it. And that's what we all have to get to, I think. And But we, to get there, we have to begin to dismantle all the distortions and, and the inaccurate belief systems and wherever they came from. But we have to look in that mirror and see that within ourselves and then be able to access that truth that I think came here with us each in our hearts. Yeah, yeah. I do believe it came here. And I love that my sister was 12 years old tainted i don't I, I, to be honest with you i don't actually know how because I, I know my dad's right. side of the family right. i don't know how she did that right. and you know let's talk about this because this is now a conversation where we move into a point of action you know we already understand what the crossroad is you know we have now more things on a plate than we did when you all started this show right absolutely absolutely and just kind of thinking about this idea of allyship. I read an article um, as we were kind of putting together one of our episodes, one of our earlier episodes, and it was an article that was about that there's this rare group of people, specifically white people, who grow up in racialized environments, right? at the local level, if you will, their towns, their homes, and, and all of that. But they don't take on that posture of being racist. It's just something about some of those individuals. And I think the key for me is that love of humanity. Because if you truly love humanity, those types of things don't even have the opportunity to, to take hold yeah. inside of you yeah. because you're just of this different caliber of individual, right? So mm -hmm. I'm saying that to say that Mavis and Gail both to me fit in that type of character, if you will. So then when I kind of start thinking about the idea of allyship, one of the things that I share with Mavis and Gail on a regular basis is that the way we set this show up, it models true allyship. And what I mean by that is if you think about anti-racism activation as a journey, Gail on the, on the one hand has been on that journey for a long time. She grew up in the sixties protesting. She worked <laughs> with the, the Panthers and, and all of that sort of thing. And she is a true ally. Mavis on the other hand, didn't have that kind of background. She basically grew up in a white community, didn't have those connections to uh, black folks in general, but it was still something in her that made her go through life and not adopt the racist stance in life. I think that's a gift. Yeah. That's a powerful, mm -hmm. powerful gift. And mm -hmm. so with the three of us coming together, uh, particularly with Mavis, because she's coming from that other type of uh, background and everything, but she brings her whole self into the work and she doesn't walk into the work and, and I'm just using Mavis as an example, right? But she doesn't walk into the, into the work like I know what you should be doing, speaking to me as a black woman who is putting together this anti-racism work. 
I think we should do it this way because I'm an expert in this and I'm an expert or that. And I have this experience because that's what a lot of people who are attempting to be allies, they want to bring their professionalism into the mix. They want to bring, you know, their degrees and all of that. But Mavis checked hers at the door. And if you want to be a true ally, you have to be willing to check that at the door because the rules of the game and true allyship are different. And allyship is not a noun. It is a verb. Not only is it a verb, but it's also a lifestyle. It's this yeah. lifestyle where you have the capacity to let the, the sense of humanity override these other little things, genderism, racism, sexism. When humanity, your, your, your idea uh, related to hum humanity overrides all of that. That's the real power of allyship, right? And also your mindset. So if you have a very fixed mindset, if you know Carol Dweck's work, she did a lot of work in the area of mindset, growth mindset, fits mindset, and then there's also a benefit uh, mindset. But that fixed mindset relates directly to racist thinking because you think in a very rigid, very structured kind of way and you have the belief that that cannot be changed. It yeah. is what it is. And if you happen to be on the short end of that, you just kind of go with the flow because that's just the way that it is. <laughs> right. Whereas if you come with a growth mindset, that's the difference between a, a true ally and a performative ally, if you will, is that the true ally is coming with this idea that something about me, I don't even know exactly what it is right now, but I feel like maybe there's something about me that I may be inadvertently doing that's contributing to the overall uh, problems, the sort of that sus sustaining the systems and the institutions and the practices and all of that. What is it about me? Because I don't like that. Mm. So mm. what is it about me that I need to change? What is that growth that needs to happen from the inside of me, starting off with my thoughts, my ideas, my beliefs, my I, attitudes? What are those things in relation to living in a racialized society? What are those things that I really think and believe? And then the mm. other side of it, is what are those things that are emerging in my words, my actions, and my behaviors? You have to have that strength, inner strength within to be a true ally because it's all about examining yourself and holding yourself accountable for the role that you decide you want to play in change. Mm. Wow. Aren't we lucky to work with Anita? Oh I mean, my God. I'm lucky to work with all three of you. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I would also like in the few minutes we have left also to hear from you, Mavis and Gail, about your, your personal messages, where this has brought you, just the way Anita, you did. You know, I asked my mama, I said, why did we move to Plainfield, New Jersey from New York? Now you understand, we could have moved to any part of New Jersey, any part. And do, you, do any of you know the history of Plainfield, New Jersey? Plainfield, New Jersey is the home of where the riots began, contrary to what everybody wants to believe, but it is the home where the riots began. And I said to my mother later on in life, I said, I got to know why Plainfield. You could have moved anywhere, mom. You could have moved to North Plainfield. You could have moved to South Plainfield. She said, yeah, she's from the South. So she said, yeah, honey, we could have. She said, but North Plainfield was way too white. South Plainfield, South Plainfield was way too much of nothing. And I knew your two sisters would never go to high school. You'd be the only one. And I needed to put you with your people. And I just looked at her like, what? Now, this is this woman. Do you understand the yeah. underpinnings of a woman I really didn't get to know till later? And she was right. I would have been lost had I not gone to Plainfield. I would have not had friends. Let's hear from you, Mavis. Let's hear from you, Gail. Because I was reminded of that thought two days ago. I'd forgotten asking my mom that question. Mavis, Gail, from you, how do you want to take us out? Take us out. Thank you all. 
Well, I do feel very grateful for the gift that Anita uh, described. I cannot take credit for my curiosity and my um, affection for uh, the black community. It just was given to me. And I want to really make use of that. I want to see what I can learn about myself. And let me tell you, this, this personal growth has just been monumental. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I'm at risk of thinking I know like everything. <laughs> I've been old enough, studied enough, but it's so not true. As Anita says, I don't know what I don't know. And this has just been a, a joy to yeah. go on this exploration. And I really encourage other people to do that. This is not an us and them sort of exercise. This is about each individual. Mm. And what role do we play in the way our society functions? Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. Gail. <laughs> that, I mean, that's true. That's right. That we each have the ability to make an imprint on anyone and everyone by just being more authentically honest with ourselves first and looking within and being able to then mm -hmm. be able to trust in what we hear and choose mm. differently if we need to choose differently. Yeah. See the truth of even what is positive, but whatever that is, we have to take that veil off of our own eyes first and be able to look within and then begin to make those changes to actually to resonate more about who we truly are as a human being and that we what we came here knowing, what we came here with, was not against humanity, it was for humanity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love it. Anita, last words? Allyship. If there's That's anybody I'm with you. out there, yeah, anybody out there who wants to know more about the work that we do together, and yeah. there's other things that we've done together behind the scenes that we haven't uh, had to talk about, but just go to theplacetosora.com and that's sort of your starting point. Yeah. You can reach out to me. There's information there about this work that we do along the lines of anti-racism, allyship, and, and all of that. So we're looking for people to come on mm -hmm. board with us and take that journey. And by the way, for all of you, I will tell you that we have a project in the works to do a two-hour show with a panel. And that panel will include people from our network, this group of women right here. Uh, Dr. Kathy O'Bear, Dr. Krista Lee Crane, and so many others. We are going to put a panel together on this in the next month. Thank you all for tuning us in and turning us on. We'll see you yeah. next time.